morning, everybody. Good morning. So let's just turn to Revelation chapter 4. And we'll come before the Lord in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we, um, we thank you for uh, your presence amongst us. Uh, we thank you for uh, this book, the Bible, and we thank you for, for the book of Revelation in it. We thank you that it's um, not a revelation just of future things, but it's a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that you'd warm our hearts this morning as we uh, look at your word, that in some way it would uh, become personal and true and real uh, to each one. Lord, would you bring understanding and light as it's needed. And, and Lord, we pray that there would be a response, maybe not quite like we see in these chapters, but a start, a touch a response of worship to the one to whom we owe all that we have, all that we are, and our future destiny. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've come um, in the first three chapters of Revelation uh, from an earthly scene. And you'll recall that the book of Revelation was written to the seven churches. And that's important to remember because when we get to heaven here in chapter 4 and 5, remember this has been written to people who are facing a great deal of persecution, of trial, of suffering. I don't know how much heaven matters to you. <laughs> and when you read these passages, and we'll have a look at chapter 5 as well, um, I don't know how real it seems to you. But one thing I'm certain of, and that is that the more that we experience suffering, trial, the more that we see trouble in the world, the more uncomfortable things become, the more wonderful the prospect of heaven seems. And that was, that was the kind of people that this was written to. We read about it in chapters 2 and 3. Uh, some that had given their lives for their faith. Remember that it was at a time when there was on the throne an emperor. Not like our Australian democracy, and we sometimes fear maybe we're going there. But on the throne an emperor, and, and that man could say what he would on that throne, and it would be done. And people lived in fear. I'm sure there were Christians who had a sense of fear as in those seven churches that we read about they faced the consequences of this man's choices and decisions and persecutions. And so when we, it's really important when we look at this heavenly scene and when we go on later to look at the judgments and the future it's not just about the content of the judgments. It's about the truth that there's another one on the throne and he is unfolding these events. And although Caesar thought that he ruled over Rome, we're going to see that there's someone else here, someone else who really ruled. And so this is an encouragement to us, regardless of what our circumstances are like, to start to see and glimpse some of the truths that we don't always see or recognise in this world in which we live. So let's just start, we're going to start with chapter 4. Um, and what, what I want to do, it might be a little bit different. I'm not going to explain to you all about the emerald and the sardius uh, and the jasper and the crystal sea. I'm not going to explain to you all about the seven horns or the bow. 
And I know um, a lot has been written, and I've been studying this for a little while now, and let me just say there's a lot of disagreement. There are a lot of things that we don't know in these two chapters, in these heavenly scenes. There's a lot that we don't know, if we're honest. And sometimes it's good to have a holy speculation, but I would like, as we go through it, I, will, I want to make it clear when I'm speculating and I want to make it clear when I'm not so that we could see there are things here that we may try and nut out and we come to certain conclusions but they're not certain. They're not certain yet. But there are things that are plain and evident and they're the things that really matter. Because these are the things that God wanted that, that church to understand. He really, I don't think he was that concerned about the exact colour of the crystal sea before the throne. I really don't think that would have been the concern of those people there. And so as we go through, there are several things in these two chapters that are truths that... I'm sure we'll find are evident to us, they were evident to that church, and they're life-changing, they're life-transforming truths. So we're going to start at chapter 4. There's a door into heaven. We read that after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately... I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. This is the voice as like a trumpet. It's the same voice that spoke to John right in chapter 1. It's the voice of Jesus Christ. In some Bibles, I have it in red <laughs> to indicate that it's the voice of Christ. If yours doesn't have it, it doesn't matter. But the reality is that this, the person that's calling John now is Christ. We'll see him revealed a little bit more strongly in chapter 5. And he's been invited up and there's several things that are going to happen. He wants him to come up and he wants him to see. Now there's a lot in the scriptures about hearing, but here this is a vision. It's a picture. And he wants him to see something and he also wants him to see things which must be hereafter. So there is a prophetic element, and that's particularly picked up in, from chapter 6 onwards, where uh, the, the scriptures start to unfold, unfold something of what is to be. And so he's lifted up, and I don't know if you've ever been to an art gallery and you, and you see a picture. How do you look at a picture? You don't necessarily go to this one little spot and, and you know, see that colour or this one little spot and see that colour. A, a, a picture, you, you don't look at a picture the way you read a book. Okay, when we read a book, we go through step by step by step. This is a vision. This had an impression and an impact upon John. And I suppose it would be good if, if we were able to be with him to get something of that impression. But we can sense something of the impression by looking at the response of some of the beings in heaven to the one on the throne. But when we think about this picture, this vision, um, when you look at uh, a, a scene or a picture, often you, you, your thoughts go to a particular point in it. That's true. Or you see something particularly lovely over here. It's not that this is the first in a series of things in the pictures. It's just something that catches your attention because it's important, it's significant. Maybe it's just the focal point of, of the whole scene. And here, his attention immediately, because there's a lot in this vision, as we'll see. There are a lot of elements. And what's the first thing that he's attracted to? What's the first thing he writes about? Remember, Caesar's on the throne. But he sees a throne in heaven. And it says that he immediately was in the spirit. 
and he's taken up and somehow he's, he's shown this, this is portrayed and he looks and he sees that a throne was set in heaven and one sat upon the throne. The throne, the throne, uh, John loves the word throne. I think it's used, uh, I, I noted it, 62 times in the New Testament and 47 in the Revelation. Thrones mattered to John. He thought about thrones a lot. And thrones are in this book because thrones represent the sovereign ruler. In Rome, the one that sat on the throne was the sovereign earthly ruler. Whatever he said, went. In heaven, there's a throne. In heaven, there's a throne. And the first thing that he sees in the picture is that there is a throne and there's someone on the throne. And you have a look at here. How is God described? It says he that was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. Does that give you a picture of God? It doesn't really show you what God is like, does it? Uh, a sardine stone uh, is, uh, it's a bit difficult, the stones in the scripture, because um, we're not necessarily quite sure what they were. Um, we, we just don't know. But, but I believe that jasper was clear and the sardine stone was possibly red, like a ruby, also called carnelian stone. So here there's a throne. There's someone who's sitting on the throne and, and it's almost as if, if you can't describe the person sitting on the throne. Right. It's a vision. It's a picture. It's a metaphor, if you like. So what, does it, what, do, what do precious stones make you think of? Beauty, wonder, clarity, purity. And somehow or another he sees this bow, an emerald-coloured bow, whether it's uh, like a rainbow. We don't know if it was a rainbow. I guess it, it would remind John of the covenant that God had made with mankind. And he's sitting on the throne. He's sitting on the throne. There's a similar description in Ezekiel chapter 1 where it talks about the appearance of the bow that was in the cloud on the day uh, of rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. God doesn't actually sit on a physical throne. If I ascend into heaven, behold... Thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, thou art there. How can God communicate what he is like to mortal and limited man? He can't. But he, he, can, he can just, he gives John a glimpse. And he wants John to capture this sense that uh, there's someone here that is beyond description. One of the hymn writers described him this way, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from mine eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. So we see the colours, we see the stones, we see the bow, we don't actually see God, but there's one on the throne. And we know that he's the sovereign Lord. One day we'll see Jesus face to face, God incarnate. But I don't know how we'll perceive God when we'll be in heaven. We'll see him more clearly than John saw him here. But... We won't be able to draw him in the way that you would draw a person like you or me on a picture. 
In verses 5 and 6 it goes on to say, Out of the throne proceeds lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So you've got this sense, and, and often in the scriptures God is associated with lightning, with thunder, with rumbling. I don't know, I've never been in a storm in Darwin, but I've seen some, I guess, smaller storms here in Adelaide. And they, they, you can feel the whole rumble. And I've seen pictures of, of, of storms in Darwin where it's just continuous sheets of lightning, just about lightning everywhere, all the time. Frightening. It could be a frightening experience. And, and so when God is described in this, this way and associated with lightning and thunder, it's not as if he's standing up there like a Zeus, you know, throwing thunderbolts. It's not a picture of God at all. What it's really saying is just, it's just the same way that, that, that a, before a storm we are powerless and helpless. And it evokes in us a certain response of of awe and maybe smallness. God is like that. If we really come into his presence, that, that will evoke that kind of response, just as, a, as, a, as a, a large storm would evoke that kind of response. And so it is here. So God, we have God on the throne. He's sovereign. He's light. There's colour, there's beauty. You could say um, the stones are precious of great value. He's awe-inspiring. He's confronting. So this is the first, first thing that, that John notices in his vision in the picture. He doesn't lose it at all. It's there. And then he notices something else. In the, verse 4, round about the throne were four and 20 seats, 24 seats, and on there there were 24 elders. They were sitting clothed in white raiment, they had on their heads crowns of gold. These were victors' crowns uh, rather than um, the diadem, the crown that marked a ruler's um, authority. So, so here there were 24 elders. And again, we get stuck. <laughs> Who were the elders? Some people say they were... Um, Angels or heavenly beings. Some say they were heavenly representatives of the faithful. Uh, 24 was a number of representation. In the law of Moses, there were 24 orders of priests. And if you read, you go on and on. There are, there are, there are many thoughts and theories and ideas. And I just have to say, um, I don't know. And I don't think any of us could really know. We can ask them when we get there. We don't know. But you know, what? we, we come to the uh, even a, a more difficult passage in verses 6 to 8. It says, Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about there were four beasts. Well, now here it gets um, fantastical, really. We've got the first beast was like a lion and the second beast a calf and the third beast a face as of a man and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts in verse 8 had each of them six wings about him and they were full of eyes within and they rest not day and night. We'll just stop there for a moment. So here there are... I wish I was an artist. I would try and draw this. Some people have. You've got these beasts and there's these four faces. And again, they're the same beasts and faces portrayed in the Old Testament uh, in Ezekiel. Uh, also, you'll notice in Isaiah chapter 6, there are the cherubim that are portrayed as having six wings and they're singing the same song that we'll, we'll see in a moment of holy, holy, holy. Um, I don't know what they are. I'm not even sure what they represent. Now I've read a great deal about um, what they might represent 
So some would say that the lion is representative of majesty and omnipotence, that the ox represents faithful labour and patience, that the eagle as the greatest bird represents sovereignty, uh, that man represents nobility and intelligence. I don't know about intelligence for man, but anyway. <laughs> so some have said, well, these are, these are characteristics. These are characteristics that reflect the characteristics of God. Sorry. Perhaps that's so. Perhaps that's so. But I don't know. Strange, isn't it? The more we look at the picture, the less we know. The less we know. So we're not sure about the elders, who they are, other than that they're around the throne. We're not sure about the beasts, who they are, other than they were in the midst of the throne. We're not sure who they are, but we are. We're 100% sure about what they're doing. And I, I believe this is the truth that God wants us to grasp from this chapter and the next chapter. Right? We can allow our sanctified imagination to paint the picture any way we like. Any way we like. And that's fine. But the truth that's portrayed here, the first truth was in the beginning of chapter 4 that there is one on the throne. There's no question about that. You don't need to disentangle all the imagery to understand that God is a sovereign ruler on the throne. And you don't need to disentangle all the imagery to understand this, that these beasts who, as powerful and as great as they are, can only fall in worship before this God on the throne. And we see that they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when the beasts give glory and honour and thanks to him who sat on the throne, who lives forever and ever, and then the 24 elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and they worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. For for thy, or in accordance with thy will, they are and they were created. So what were these people doing? They were unceasingly worshipping God. Does that sound like a good thing to do? You know, when I was a younger Christian, I, I kind of thought the idea of a heaven where all you did was worship God didn't, didn't seem all that great to me. I'll be honest. The idea of heaven that was away from all the suffering seemed like a good idea. But wouldn't it get a bit dull just to spend all your time worshipping God? I don't know if you're anything like me, if you live in this frail flesh... Right, you get bored with things, true. <laughs> things become a little bit um, dull over time. Th these these creatures here is saying, these beasts. It says they rest not day and night, saying, "Holy, holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come." Now. Maybe you could think, well, maybe the beasts aren't as smart and, you know, maybe they don't think as much as we do and they, don't have a, they can't contemplate so much and so just to do this very simple thing of worshipping God is sufficient to keep them going forever and ever. I don't think so. Right? These beasts and the elders, whoever they are, were not in a fallen state like we are. They were not in a sinful state like we are. So their capacities and their capabilities and, and all that they knew and could do is far beyond anything that we could know or could do. So how is it, how is it that such 
beings and creatures could spend all their days worshipping God like this? Do you have an answer to that? I believe that the reason, the only reason that we become tired in our worship, apart from our human bodies becoming tired, but tired in the sense of distracted or no longer interested. The only reason is that we do not see what they see. We do not see what they see. And I believe that the heart... You see, they did not worship God here because they were forced to worship God. We will see later that there are some that will be forced to worship, at least forced to fall down and acknowledge God. But these, these beings here, they're not worshipping as, as, a, as an external compulsion. They're not worshipping because uh, they've got nothing else to do. They're worshipping in this... They are so captivated by God that the response is a forever and ever and ever worship. I can only say we, we need to pray that God would show us a glimpse of himself. Because whenever I get tired, whether it's in prayer or whether it's in praise or any of those things, it's really reflecting, I think, that I'm not seeing him as he is. And that's okay. He's gracious. He hasn't crushed me yet. It's grace that's led me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. It's a wonderful thought. So these people, uh, so when you think that, oh, well, maybe, maybe forever and ever, you know, worshipping in heaven's not going to be a great part, it will, it will be something that you won't be able to keep yourself from. You see, they look, look at something of what they see. They say, thou art worthy. Remember, this is the Lord God Almighty, not little Caesar on the throne. This is the Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, who is to come. The same phrase that's used of Christ as well. He is the one in verse 11 who's worthy to receive glory and honour and power. Why? Because he's created it all. It wasn't, it wasn't from some out-of-nothing evolutionary scenario where we've all come. He's created every single thing, from the tiniest subatomic particle through to the cosmos, and he's created you and me. And these creatures, however strange and fantastical they seem to us, these creatures, whoever they were, could see something that, of this, that they were indebted to this God who had made them, who had fashioned them. Our daughter had a child last Sunday. And when you see that little life and you think, within that mother's womb, God knit together a life more than a soul. A living soul. He made that little one. That little one belongs to him. No less than you and I belong to him. So they could see it. Well, they see it more than we do. But, but just think, if, if we can see and sense and know how indebted we are to our creator... For all that we, our very breath, our very breath. 
you know, it's a fearful thing when you think of some of the things that's happening in, te you know, with the terrorist movements and ISIS and, and people being killed. Uh, you know, it would have been a frightening thing to be in Paris when all those things were happening. He, but here, how, how frightening, awesome to be in the presence of someone who, who doesn't have to move and you're, you've just, you're destroyed. He can make you or break you, as he will. And he created everything, not at a whim, not according to our expectations or desires. He, he made it all, he created it. It says, by thy ple it's, 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 what it's saying is, is for or by thy will, in accordance with your will and purpose. You made it as you chose to make it. And I'm so thankful he made me. Or maybe you're not so thankful he made me. <laughs> but it's a blessing. We're going to move on quickly. Chapter 5. We can't stop here. We're still in heaven. I saw... So remember, his, 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 he's had this vision. He saw the throne. He's seen the beasts and the elders. And now he's seen them falling before their creator. And now the scene set, shifts. John sees on the one who is in the throne, on his hand, on his right hand, it says in, in it's on his hand, that sat on the throne a book right, written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. This book is going to be opened in the later chapters. In the book there are hidden the purposes, the outworking of God's Land, as he's revealed it in the book of Revelation. But at this point, we have God has the book in his hand and a strong angel, he proclaims with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose. And no man, no one, actually in heaven or earth or under the earth, this angel had quite a loud voice. <laughs> right. So the call came out to everyone. Who is worthy? Who is able to open this book? And, and nobody was found to be worthy. Nobody could open this book. Nobody was worthy. They, no one had the authority. No one had the right. No one had the power. No one, in verse 3, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And John weeps. He weeps because, well, maybe, maybe he's distressed that in all the universe and cosmos there's no one that's worthy to do, to do this, this act. I don't, maybe, maybe the sense overpowered him of just how hopeless we really are and how helpless. Maybe he was distressed because... God had promised that he was going to show him the things to come and thus sealed and maybe it's not going to be opened. So he won't, he won't get to see something of God's workings. I, I, I don't know. Both of those thoughts have been suggested. But be that as it may, John is very distressed. It says um, uh, in verse... Um, for I wept much, or he wailed, uh, because no one was found worthy to open the book. And then you get this picture. One of the elders said, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, and we'll stop there just for a moment. So here it is. Here is someone who's unique. 
You know, sometimes I've spoken with people from different religious faiths and, 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 and there are many teachers and great prophets of different uh, religious persuasions. But, but none of them is unique like this one. It's unique. See? None, no one else was actually worthy whatever all that entailed, no one had the right, the authority to unfold what was to be. And no one, no one, as we see, could be the one who was dead and, behold, is alive forevermore. So every prophet, every founder, every leader is dead in the grave you can uh, uh, the, the, the Muslims will go to the grave of Muhammad to the bones but you can't go and see the bones of, of Christ he's here He's the sovereign ruler. He's different. He's unique. He's distinct. And they, John sees this picture, and it's a strange description, a lion of majestic and yet a lamb. Of the root of... It says of David. Now, he has been referred to as a root of Jesse, David's father, but here is the only place he's referred to as a root of David. He's of the line of David. God himself and yet incarnated, made man from this root, from this lineage of David in some miraculous way which we celebrate in the next month. God contracted to a span, incomprehensibly made man. But here we don't see him as the little babe. Here we see him as the lion and as the lamb. And look how it describes the lamb, as though slain. If it, as if, as it had been slain. And the seven horns and seven eyes, they were picturing the seven spirits of God, this seven spirits of God refers to the Holy Spirit. We can't, uh, we, we can't spend a lot of time there, but if you go back, you see in Revelation chapter 1, um, where it first mentions that uh, in the description of God, the Father and the Son, in verse 4 it says, uh, um, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And they together are worshipped. Nobody else in Revelation is worshipped, by the way, except God on the throne, the Lamb, and the spirits. No one else. Even the angel, when John goes to bow before him, he says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. So here we have the Lamb, and somehow God's Spirit is at work there. Remember, it's a vision. It's not, there's not a literal lamb sitting there, just like there's not a literal throne sitting there. It doesn't mean it's not a true God. It's just that we don't have the capacity to, to perceive and to see it. He, he can't paint a picture for us to see. No man can see God and live. But we can see enough. And he pictures it as a lamb. Why does he do that? Why a lamb? Because he was the lamb of God, slain. Before the foundation of the world, he, he bore our sins, just as the sacrificial lamb was, was sacrificed in the days of Israel to atone for sins. When Christ came on the scene, John looked at him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, the one Lamb, the unique one who takes away the sins of the world. 
once for all. And, and you see that now because when they go on and it, and it says there um, uh, in verse 9, um, they sang a new song, and this day is the beasts and the elders. Uh, they fell down before the lamb in verse 8. Uh, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours which are the prayers of the saints and they sung a new song saying thou art worthy to take the book now remember when they sang thou art worthy O Lord in chapter 4 why, why was he worthy? because he made, made us all we're indebted to him because our very existence we owe to him why is he worthy here? have a look It says, thou worthy, because this is a new song. The first song was the other song. Here's here's a new song. Here's a new song. This is not just the creation song. They sung this new song, thou art worthy to take the book, to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, hast, hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nations. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and and we shall reign on the earth. If seeing on the throne our creator doesn't bring from us a sense of indebtedness and worship, then what about seeing on the throne our redeemer? He did not have to make us by his will he did that he did not have to redeem us our own sinfulness and willfulness for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God our own sinfulness and willfulness has a deserved punishment our desert was death and, and these beings, they cannot contain themselves. When they see him, this lamb, who, who was slain in order by his blood to redeem us, to purchase us out of bondage. Can you see, in the midst of all the picture, John's seeing several things. He's seen the sovereign throne. He's seeing the creator of heaven and earth and, and the, the response that is, that's just a necessary response of these beings forever and ever worshipping him. And they see the lamb in heaven. Who's on the throne, the lamb or, or God? They're both on the throne. See, the lamb was in the midst, but when we go to the end here, it just, these people, everybody's caught up, so caught up in wonder, love and praise that it's, it's just, it's all together. There is this one great chorus of worship to God, to the lamb. Let's just read that. He says, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and beasts and the elders, the number of them was 10,000 times hundreds of millions. I mean, I, I don't think they're actually counting the number. It's just it's a numerable number. You imagine hundreds of millions of beings. And, and every one of them recognise the greatness and the wonder of what the Lamb has done of what Christ has done. And they say with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing in every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I say. Now how many is that? How many is that? It says every creature, wherever, wherever, Every creature. So the hundreds of millions that he sees in his vision and even beyond that, in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea, the response is all the same. Now this hasn't quite happened yet. But it's going to happen. 
And, and the time's hard to disentangle in these chapters. It really is. But it doesn't matter. God is timeless. You know, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright, shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. It's all the same, the beginning from the end. Once they're in heaven worshipping God, it, you don't have to figure out where you're going to place this in the spot. <laughs> And, and these, the, every one of these creatures is saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever, and the four beasts say, Amen. And the four, 24 elders fall down and worship him that lives forever and ever. Who are they worshipping? Have a look, verse 13. He that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. See, we teach scripturally that there's God the Father, God the Son, the Lamb here, and the Holy Spirit. And we don't understand that. But somehow the triune God is represented here. We, can't understand, we can understand the way he works maybe a little bit. We, we can't see the Spirit, but we know the Spirit of God blows where, like the wind wherever it will and it influences us and touches our hearts. We can, of all of them, we can picture easiest the Lord Jesus because he was incarnate. He wore the body which he still has in heaven. And as the Father, God, the Spirit who, who, who's unconfined, well, him we can't picture. But we can worship. We can worship. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul painted a picture of Christ. And he said he, he made him to be, no, it says, um, let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Every knee, that's what we see here, of things in earth, of things under the earth, and wherever else. was, <laughs> And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God our Father. If you don't see it today, friend, if it doesn't bring from our hearts a worship that it should, well, we should, we should ask the Lord to forgive us. We should ask him to give us such a fullness of himself that we, although we can't imagine it now, but we can work towards it. We can get to the place where we can see that perhaps to worship this one forever and ever, however that works out in practice, will be something that we will not be able to help ourselves doing. And for now, we can cultivate that walk with him. You see, if you spend no time contemplating God on the throne, if you spend no time at all reading the Gospels and seeing Christ, then it's little wonder that your heart's cold. The reason these people responded the way, and, and they were much greater than we, the reason they fell the way they did was they saw something we're not seeing. And if you don't look, you won't see. And if you don't see, you, you won't be in that place. But one day God will put you in the place. And either we willingly today cry out to him, as our saviour and bow our knee or the day will come when we will like it or not bow our knee and like it or not our tongue will confess because this is who he is 
He's God on the throne. Let me finish. From earthly scene of struggle, sin and pain, the eternal Christ speaks to John again. A trumpet voice denied it cannot be, come up here to heaven itself and see. A scene beyond the grasp of human mind, a future known to God to which we're blind. This is these two chapters. Breathtaking vision of beauty and awe of colour, light and wonder that John saw. But picture only poor and pale and faint of heaven high the vision's brush can paint. Of the sovereign upon the throne that's there, he whose visage is bright beyond compare. We see the throne, the elders, beasts, and so, the crystal sea, the precious stones, the bow. And guess we might what all these things may mean, for guess it is, as much remains unseen. But shining from the vision plain and clear, revealed the truth of God and Christ is here. The truth that God sits ever on the throne, sovereign and almighty, holy, alone. Eternal he who spoke and made us all, before whose throne the beasts and elders fall, and worship, honour, praise our God on high, who cannot praise enough, although they try. The truth that there enthroned with God as one, the Lamb as slain, who has redemption won, his very blood he shed upon the tree for fallen, sinful, broken man for me. And angel hosts, the beasts, the elders all, each creature high and low in worship fall. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we are just conscious of our own limitations, uh, even our own tiredness this morning, and, and we are frail beings, and yet we do pray that you would give us a, a, a more of a glimpse of Jesus so that more about Jesus would we see, that we would learn to have that upward look and we would learn to see him in a way that draws this response of wonder, love and praise. And we confess that it's not there as it ought to be, uh, but I just pray for each one here that we would be encouraged to, uh, to take this and, and to look upwards and to to get that um, vision that would uh, draw from our hearts the worship that is due to your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.